Hi, welcome everybody. This is Nora, and uh, we're waiting for a few people to come in. Uh, Chelsea Castro is with me today, and she's going to introduce herself in just a few moments. Um, before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping measures. Um, we're going to be sharing a number of strategies with you folks this afternoon, um, and we may have questions that we might not get a chance to answer. So if you do have questions, please put them in the chat. That, that chat will be monitored, and we'll save a little bit of time at the end of the presentation to answer any questions that you might have. If we don't get to all of the questions that you have, uh, we're also going to drop our emails in the chat, and you can just email us directly with any questions that you might have either today or if they come up for you later as you're working on some of the things that we talk about this afternoon. So with that, we are going to go ahead and get started. I'm gonna just briefly, again, welcome you folks and say, uh, I'm a practice advisor with Atticus and I've been a practice advisor with Atticus since 2006. So I work with law firms and lawyers around the country, coaching them on all the Atticus foundational processes, time management, marketing, uh, staffing, financial systems, and cash flow. But in addition to that, over the years, I've created a book series called 50 Lessons for Lawyers. The latest book in that series is 50 Lessons for Happy Lawyers. And my co-author on this third book in the series is Chelsea Castro. And Chelsea and I are going to be with you today sharing some strategies uh, from the book as we go forward. So I'm going to let Chelsea say just a little bit about herself, and then we're going to get things kicked off. Thanks, Nora. Uh, just like Nora, I'm a former lawyer turned coach, and I'm also a psychotherapist who focuses on helping lawyers live, work, and feel better through science-based skills and strategies. And it's been such a pleasure working on this book with Nora. We have very aligned uh, perspectives and approaches, and uh, it's actually I'm really proud to say that it's an excellent and practical approach to a lot of the challenges that lawyers face. Thank you, Nora. It's Chelsea. Thank you. All right, let's get started. First, let's just say Atticus is, I'm, I'm thrilled to bring this to the Atticus community uh, because Atticus really is all about helping lawyers grow great practices and at the same time understand that their practice and their life both have to be great. So cultivating great lives along the way. Uh, and that's what we're here to help you do this afternoon. Also want to invite you to get connected to the Atticus community if you're not already connected with us. So you're going to get a PDF of this presentation after we finish up. You have links here that give you all of our social media uh, platforms, whichever one you might be interested in or all of them, please connect with us. And also uh, one of our practice advisors, Steve Riley has launched his own podcast where he interviews lawyers that are doing some really phenomenal things. So sign up subscribe and listen to Steve's podcast too, because I guarantee you that you'll learn some things that you'll be able to apply in your own practice. So let's get started. Let's talk about 10 ways to reduce your anxiety, boost your health and well-being. But before we start with the strategies, I'll let Chelsea talk with you a little bit about why these strategies are so important. As we saw, but we're not necessarily all that surprised by back in 2016 with the uh, seminal Hazel and Betty Ford study on lawyers across the United States, our profession is in a crisis. Uh, we have a higher rate of anxiety, depression, substance abuse, and a number of other problematic life issues than the general population. And there is a reason for this. But while that Hazel and Betty Ford study confirmed perhaps what many of us already knew was a problem in our profession because of a lot of the nature of the work that we do. That doesn't mean that you are just a statistic. That certainly does not mean that you have to be part of that culture, or in other words, be just one of the numbers, because you are not just a number. You do not have to submit to just accepting that, well, lawyers have a hard time. And so I'm going to be one of those lawyers that's downtrodden and always exhausted and always stressed out and don't have a social life. No, that might be in the scientific studies as a common experience, but it doesn't have to be your experience. And we're here today to talk to you about ways in which you can take proactive steps 
and reducing anxiety and re increasing your well being and happiness. The key factor being you. Indeed, the key factor being you. Yes, these strategies to follow up what Chelsea was just saying. We have designed these strategies so that you can actually start doing these things to have an impact on your anxiety level and your well being, your health, and your happiness. So, with that in mind, uh, we have a challenge for you. We're going to talk to you about 10 different strategies. Our challenge is to choose one and start today and stick with it. And by the way, I'm going to ask you to take notes along the way. Uh, because there's a lot of power in taking handwritten notes. So grab your legal pad, take notes along the way. At the end of this presentation, pick one strategy and absolutely start doing it today. Strategy number one, the one thing that can change everything. You've probably heard about this strategy before. Uh, we're gonna talk to you just a little bit about the power of mindfulness meditation. Uh, and the reason that we start with this is because for both Chelsea and I, lawyers come to us and they want something in their practice or their life to change. They want to have more income. They want to have more control over their time. Perhaps they want to rediscover what they used to love to do that they can't do anymore. Or they just want to feel less anxiety and less stress. Well, the one thing that can help with all of those things is mindfulness meditation. I have a quote there from a poet. His name is David White. All things change when we do. Until we start to change, nothing around us is really going to change. So we're gonna talk briefly about the benefits of mindfulness, okay? And, and let me just say this too, for some of you guys who are kind of like, ugh, they're talking about mindfulness again, meditation, I can't go there. I want you to think about it this way. The concept of meditation kind of analogous to the word sports. So when you say the word sports, there's all kinds of sports, right? Football, baseball, golf, running, tennis, you name it. Meditation is the same. There are very, there are a lot of different types of meditative practices, but the one that's been shown to really have the most benefits for us is mindfulness meditation. And that is probably something that you're at least familiar with if you don't have a practice. And mindfulness meditation asks us to focus on the present moment. It's all about being in the present moment. Uh, typically we focus on our breath and then folks will say, well, I can't focus on my breath because I have millions of thoughts going through my mind. That's okay. We all do. We all have monkey mind to some degree. Um, one of the books that we cite in our book says that actually being bad at meditation, i.e. having lots of thoughts running around in your head, is really good because you begin to notice those thoughts and come back to your focus on your breath or whatever it may be. And why do it? There are many more reasons that show on, than are shown on this slide, but it helps you manage stress, helps you limit distractions, increase your focus, boost productivity, supports positivity, increases your self-awareness, helps reduce negative emotions, and increases creativity, increases patience and tolerance, and it is will generally just help every aspect of your life, both physical and emotional. So how do you start? Consistency is key. It's much better to meditate or practice mindfulness for three minutes a day. Even three minutes a day can make a difference rather than 30 minutes a week. Be patient with yourself. You're going to experience lots of thoughts in your mind, just like clouds in the sky. Be patient and experiment with apps. Three of my favorites, our favorites are Headspace, Insight Timer, and Calm. There are many out there, but just try it. Experiment. And in doing meditation, it actually can help us in supporting our goals in the second strategy, being get clear on your why. So what are we talking about with get here clear on your why? Essentially, we want you to work through finding out why you're even getting up and going to this job, right? The first thing you might say, well, I need to get paid. I have bills to pay. Yes, of course. But if you keep boiling that down, 
most people will find that it's because they want to support their family, because they want to support their communities financially or through time, because they value achievement, they value loyalty, so on and so forth. We all have a particular set of values, none good, not bad, but just things that drive us. And for many lawyers and people who are high achievers in very demanding professions, it's easy to lose sight of those because we're always putting out all the fires in front of us. There's a study by Lawrence Krieger a while back, which asked what makes lawyers happy and satisfied with their careers. And through a slew of funny and unusual circumstances, the data eventually showed that there are three factors that lead to a happy and satisfying legal career, regardless of what area of law you're in, how far in your career you are, so on and so forth. Actually, it even can be used as predictors. And those factors are authenticity, interconnectedness, and uh, competence or internal motivation for work. And with this figuring out your why, it goes straight to the authenticity factor in predicting your happiness and satisfaction in work. Because in a nutshell, authenticity is the measure of the disparity between our values and our behaviors. And dozens of independent studies from this have shown us that the greater the disparity between our values and our behaviors, the greater the likelihood for things such as anxiety, depression, substance abuse, and a whole slew of other unhealthy coping mechanisms. The lesser the disparity between our values and our behaviors, the lesser the likelihood of those unhelpful, unhealthy coping mechanisms and issues. So in boiling it down for our goal here, the more likely you are to be clear on your why, those values that drive your life forward with meaning, the more likely you are to be able to make choices that are aligned with those values and thus decrease the likelihood of anxiety and depression. And then that brings us to our third strategy, as Nora already alluded to, rekindling your friendship with pen and paper. And yes, I totally support Nora's suggestion and wanna encourage you too to take notes by hand, you know, do you remember taking notes by hand way back? I mean, I know that's how I went to school. It really, it does say something. Um, it may seem obvious to those of us who grew up in an analog era, but there's a few generations now who didn't. And studies have taken a look at the differences in learning and retention and have found consistently that when we actually take pen to paper to write things down, whether it's exploratory or planning a list of some sort, whatever it happens to be, writing it down actually registers differently in our brains in a positive way. It improves our memory, it helps improve critical thinking, and it helps improve comprehension. And in the most basic sense, the way this works is that if we're typing away, there's less of a physical connection between the thoughts and the, and the actual body, putting it out there. Taking it a step further, when we're writing, we have to actually really think through all of the meticulous different movements, which might seem natural to us now, but our brains and muscles still have to get those done. Add to the ante, if you're writing in cursive, it actually slows the brain down even more and helps improve critical thinking, comprehension, and memory even more. But we're not looking for cursive here, we're just encouraging you to take a step back and allow your brain and body to make that connection so that you can have the better memory, get clear on what's that on that list and have a better understanding of let's say the what you're writing as a result of what you're reading. Thanks, Chelsea. And just a quick follow-up on that. One great way to do exactly what Chelsea is suggesting, i.e. writing in your own handwriting, is to plan your day in your own handwriting. Not necessarily on your computer, not on your tablet, on your phone, but to literally write out of what you want to accomplish on a given day. So what you're seeing on your screen now is an Atticus tool designed exactly for that. Uh, you're going to get a copy of this. I think we're going to either drop it in the chat for you or it's going to be attached to the materials when you get this webinar probably early next week. But 
play with it, experiment with it, strategize with it, and start challenging yourself to do some writing in your own handwriting. I have to do this myself because I don't really like to do it. Why? Because I have horrible handwriting. Why? Because I haven't handwritten for a lot of time. Um, and I suspect that maybe some of you folks might be challenged that way too, but it really does make that mind body connection much more intensely than simply typing. Okay. On to strategy number four, sleep, the importance of sleep. You've got to get enough quality sleep to be at your best. Um, I'm kind of like Walt Meisner, Wilson Meisner in this aspect. Uh, the amount of sleep most people require is five minutes more. That's, that's me, I gotta admit. <laughs> but what happens, what happens when we don't get enough sleep? Uh, we cite a really great book in our book by a man named John Medina. He's a molecular biologist. And I don't really get into reading slides a lot, but I've got to read this one. The bottom line is that sleep loss means mind loss. Sleep loss cripples thinking in just about every way you can measure thinking. Sleep loss hurts attention, executive function, immediate memory, working memory, mood, quantitative skills, logical reasoning, ability, and general math knowledge. All of those things. And all of those things are incredibly valuable to your work as a lawyer. So if you're of the mindset that you sleep really is a luxury and you're not getting the amount of sleep that's right for you, for most people, it's around seven or eight hours a night. You may be different. You might need a little more to be at your best. You might need a little less to be at your best. Um, but whatever it is for you, find that and then work to create some good sleep habits around that. So what do we suggest? Keep a journal in your own handwriting. Note how much sleep you've had when you feel at your best. And then you can get a sense of how much you need. And then again, these, these suggestions come from the National Sleep Foundation and other sleep researchers. They're not just coming from Chelsea and me. Turn off your electronics, phones, tablets, computers, at least 30 minutes before you go to sleep. Keep your bedroom dark. Even the light from a cable TV box or an electronic clock or something like that can disturb your sleep. When I am traveling and I go to a hotel that has a clock radio on the nightstand, I take it and I turn it over. I put it face down because I never use it anyway because just that light can be disturbing to me and you might find the same to be true for you. And then finally, keep your bedroom cool. Um, what's cool for you depends on you. Um, sleep studies will tell us that around 68 degrees is about the right temperature, but you've got to find what's right for you and then start to create those habits. Talking about habits, we need to get more in the habit of getting our butts up and out of our chairs because that is our next strategy here. Uh, I'm sure your life as a lawyer is not all different what, from my, what mine used to be in that me and the chair were very well acquainted. Uh, the life of a lawyer can result in us not being able, feeling like we can justify getting up and out of that chair because every moment spent in that chair in front of the screen is a moment in which we are contributing to our work. And those moments in which we're not contributing to our work somehow in our log lawyer logic reasoning is not worth it. But the thing is, those hours outside of the chair actually can contribute to the effectiveness and the focus and the efficiency of the hours we do spend in that chair. So as you guessed it, we're talking about exercise. And yes, of course, I, we could go on and on about how for decades people have been telling us you need to exercise at least 30 minutes of uh, a session for three days a week and so on and so forth. We all know we need to exercise more. But the why, especially for lawyers, is particularly interesting and important. Exercise has consistently been found, regardless of the type of exercise, to fight depression by increasing our serotonin levels in the brain. Serotonin is that hormone that helps us feel good about things. So by increasing our serotonin levels in general, it makes us more resilient, in fact, for the troubles and the challenges that we face when we're sitting in that chair. 
course, it elevates mood and it helps us respond more effectively to stress as well. Because in the big picture, when we are, let's say, doing cardiovascular exercise, our brains and bodies are engaging in a fight or flight experience, but it's a safe one. And it's one that in the end, once we finish and conclude our exercise, we see that, hey, we have survived that tiger that was chasing us. And in a sense, that sort of healthy stress experience for the brain and body helps us train, if you will, for the stressors that we encounter in our work. When we're sitting in that chair and we're faced by those invisible saber-toothed tigers, because we've done that training outside of the office, we're better equipped to deal with the stressors that come in our daily work. And of course, then that brings us to our fight or flight. The more in tune we are with our bodies and our ability to notice the breathing, the heart rate, the more equipped we are to, to manage our responses to that. So again, when we're exercising and we're training that brain and body to calm down after a rigorous workout from that invisible threat, because exercise is like fight or flight, we are better equipped to tell our own bodies to calm down when there is an invisible saber tooth tiger coming through the screen because we have that mind body connection, because we've laid those neural pathways already for how to calm the body down. So exercise can help you not just in the moment, but while you're still sitting in that chair typing away. Thanks, Chelsea. Before we go on to the next strategy, I just want to say something about this image of this woman running, getting physical exercise, which we know now through science is good for us, it builds our heart muscle, etc. 40 or 50 years ago, you weren't likely to see people outside running around on the streets unless they were being chased by somebody. Because 40 or 50 years ago, we did not yet know and understand the benefits of exercise for our brains and bodies. And if you're taking notes right now, I'm gonna ask you to jot this down, please. There's a book called Peak, P-E-A-K Mind, by a woman named Amishi Jha, who is a neuroscientist at the University of Miami. And her book is absolutely a must read for anyone who wants to increase their focus, be more productive, be healthier, et cetera. And it is about her studies for mindfulness meditation. She's done a lot of work with the military uh, throughout the years and it's fascinating research. But the one thing that I wanted to say is that in her book, she talks about the fact that, you know, 50 years ago, nobody was out there jogging. We didn't think it was important to jog. And most people thought it was kind of maybe crazy or a fad when it started. She said, that's where mindfulness meditation is now. Because mindfulness meditation is like training our brains to be better, to think better, to give us all of the benefits that you saw in one of the earlier slides in this presentation. So if you want to be ahead of the curve, uh, start your mindfulness practice as soon as you can to start training your brain in the same way that we train our body with exercise. Strategy number six. This strategy comes from a book called Micro Resilience. Uh, and in that book, the, the authors talk about five frameworks to build micro resilience throughout the day. First, let's talk about, you know, what is resilience? Resilience is our ability to bounce back from problems, to bounce back from setbacks. Um, you can kind of think of a sponge. When you squeeze a sponge and let it go, it bounces back. Uh, Humans are actually better than sponges, and we can build a resilient self by taking care every day to build resilience into our day so that when we face setbacks, when we face problems, we can bounce back perhaps even better than we were before. As a matter of fact, the book that I just mentioned, Peak Mind by Amishi Jha, she has coined the phrase pre resilience or pre-resilience. Mindfulness, according to Dr. Jaw's research, helps us not be as affected by setbacks and problems than we would be if we were practicing mindfulness. You get how much I'm talking about the mindfulness thing? I do think it's really important. 
But let's talk about these five strategies. Number one, refocus. So if you're an Atticus client or part of the Atticus community, you know how important it is and how much we talk about limiting needless interruptions throughout the day. How do you do that? By building focus time into your day. What is focus time? Uninterrupted time where you're not answering emails, texts, phone calls, etc. Do your best to build focus time into your day so that you could refocus your brain on those things that you want to be working on and not be distracted by other things. Reset is the second thing. If you are feeling stressed out, if you feel like that saber toothed tiger is chasing you, take 30 seconds and reset. The easiest way to reset your body, engage your parasympathetic nervous system, which helps you calm down, is to simply just take five deep breaths. Give yourself the moment to take five deep breaths and reset your body. Number three, reframe. Do your best to reframe challenging situations. We talk a lot about this, but it's simply that very often because of the negativity bias in our brain, we want to label things as bad when they happen to us. Maybe the things that happen are really not so bad. Maybe they're just things that happen to us. Do your best to reframe situations when you can in the most positive light that you can. Number four, refresh. Simply, as, as Chelsea just said a moment ago, you know, lawyers come to work, they sit in their chair, and sometimes they're glued to that chair until they come up for air at five o'clock or six o'clock or seven o'clock in the afternoon. And they think they're being productive. But in reality, that is antithetical to what is best for our brains. Do your best to take a short break every 30 minutes. And by short, I mean really short, 30 seconds. Stand up, stretch, look out the window, have a drink of water break the pattern and then come back fresh to what you're working on. And then maybe every 90 minutes, you take a little bit longer break. I keep weights in my office, lift some weights for a few minutes. Do something to give your brain a break from what you're doing so that you can come back refreshed. And then that final piece of those five frameworks speaks to, again, what Chelsea talked about earlier, getting clear on your purpose. It's different from the others because if you're clear on your purpose, you are living that purpose every day but you're not going to find that purpose in a moment or two in your day. You're going to have to spend some time getting clear on what your why is. But if you know what it is, it builds into all the other four frameworks of those five that you can use to build more resilience into your life. And that brings us to strategy seven. Feed your brain a healthy diet. On the first glance, this Seems a little odd, doesn't it, right? Like, all right, so what are we talking about here with a healthy diet? Well, our brains, whether we're aware of it or not, and most of us are not aware of all the messages that our brains take in, are quite sensitive to the tone, especially negativity tone, uh, that comes in. So just five minutes of watching the local news can take our moods from focused, pleasant, and productive to burdened, sluggish, and unpleasant. So we need to be very careful, especially because we have such demanding careers, at how we allow things to come in and impact our minds. So let's, let's just knock out the first one here. Understanding negativity bias. Negativity bias can come at us from any direction and oftentimes also lives within us. In a nutshell, negativity bias says that we as humans, all of us, are going to naturally uh, assume the worst, if you will. So in the classic example, let's say you have $10 and you lose one of those dollars. What do most of us focus on? We focus on losing that $1 and totally forget about the fact that, hey, we got to keep nine of those dollars. So we focus on that negative. Oftentimes it's referred to as a mental filter or there's a variety of different words you may have been exposed to. But the idea here is that we often just focus in on the negative aspect of a situation. And while in some cases you make, can make the argument that that helps us problem solve, 
we tend to go way beyond just the problem solving usefulness of it and only focus in on the the loss, if you will, to the detriment of all the benefit we can gain from focusing in on the other 90%. This also is true for when people communicate to us about certain experiences or about uh, your own work performance. They might be focusing in on the negative, leading us to also only focus in on the negative naturally. And we have to work harder to realize that there's a bigger picture. Same thing goes for bigger methods of communication, like number two here with news notifications. We can understand that it's very fancy and exciting to get the real big, heavy headlines. However, because of how our brains work, we're naturally just going to attach to the drama, attach to the negativity, and forget about the bigger picture. So we need to be able to buffer ourselves from that, buffer ourselves from the onslaught of negative messaging. Even if in the big picture, there's more than just negative messaging, what our brain is more easily receiving is the negative messaging. So one of the most helpful recommendations is genuinely to turn off those news notifications. Turn off those notifications on your phone and on your computer. Instead, let's say you you like to listen to the news while you're picking up around the house or driving, we'd recommend that you perhaps listen to audiobooks instead and create a regimen for yourself of when and how you're actually going to listen to things like the news, things that might rile you up. Now, please know we're not saying that you should not be exposed or engage in whatever is happening in the news but rather be thoughtful about when you expose yourself to these things. So that brings us to the news diet one a day a week. For some people, that's what they need. They allow themselves to not be exposed to the news at all for one day a week, and that's it. And they, they get that opportunity to just breathe in and take a little bit more of a relaxing stance on things. And they, more importantly, they get to experience what is it, it's like not to be bombarded by all that negativity messaging so that they have a comparison to the other six days of the week when they allow themselves. Sometimes I work with clients where we actually designate just a certain time of day for a certain set of minutes that they expose themselves to this. So they can get the recap, but it's not a constant onslaught of all these burdens that are happening in the world. So long story short, whether it be from the internet, from your phone, from the news on the TV or the radio, or maybe that co colleague down the hall that just can't help but point out all the negative stuff in the world, we need to create some distance so that our brains can focus on what's really important for us and not be drawn into that negativity bias with every aspect of our lives. Yeah, thank you, Chelsea. And so I have a question for everybody. If you do get news pushes on your phone from news organizations, how often are they positive? And you pick it up and go, oh, wow, that's great news. Chances are pretty slim because people that push those out know what gets your attention. The negative gets your attention. All right. Strategy number eight. If you're part of the Atticus community, you know this one. Choose your clients wisely. The greatest impact on your anxiety, health, wellness, stress, you name it, there are two factors. The people you work with in your office and the clients you represent. So choose clients wisely. Uh, the graphic that you see here kind of sums it up. In, in Atticus, we use the terms A and B to delineate good clients. Clients that you like to work with, they pay their bills and they, they do all the things you ask them to do. C and D clients, uh, not so much. And perhaps they don't pay their bills. Perhaps they argue with you. They treat you poorly or they treat your staff poorly. The challenge is those C and D clients, I refer to them as thieves. They steal your money because they don't pay you or you have to chase them down to pay you. And they steal your time. Look at your own clients. If you have clients that are problem clients, I guarantee you, you are spending more time on those problem clients and they are causing you more stress and anxiety than they are worth. You're spending that time on those C and D clients and not spending time on your best clients. So what do you do about that? 
take a serious look at the clients you represent. If you don't think you have any C or D clients in your practice, ask the people who work with you. They will tell you. And then ethically, professionally, appropriately, get rid of as many a C and D clients as you can to make room for A and B clients. And then don't let any more C and D clients into the practice. If you let just one C or D client go, I guarantee you, you will feel a lot less anxiety. So talk briefly about this concept in strategy number nine, recovery. It is essential for an athlete's performance and it's essential for your performance. So what exactly is recovery? What am I talking about? Well, athletes know the importance of recovering. What is it? Recovery is the time that you are actually recovering from the exercise that you have engaged in. When you lift weights, for example, it's not the lifting of the weight that, that strengthens your muscle. When you're lifting the weight, you're actually causing what are called micro tears in your muscle. What strengthens your muscle is when you rest after that exercise and your muscle rebuilds stronger than it was. Athletes know the importance of it and you as a legal athlete should know the importance of it. The other thing that athletes understand is that you can't run marathons every single day. Every sport has its season. Every sport has downtime. You need to be able to build those concepts into the work that you do for your clients. And here's how. Number one, build what athletes refer to as active recovery into your day. If you exercise, if you cycle or you run, you know there are times when you might push, you might increase the cadence on your bike or run faster for a minute or two, stress your body, and then come back to a state where you're more relaxed. You're still running, but you're not running is hard. Build those active recoveries into your day. Similar to what I spoke about with the five frameworks. Give yourself a time during the day to refresh yourself. Number two, give yourself what athletes would refer to as rest days each week where they don't work out or they work out in a very light manner. For a lawyer, that means no work. That means not working seven days a week or necessarily looking forward to weekends because you can work more. You need to give your body and your brain time to rest. And athletes know the value of what they refer to as long-term recovery, a time away from training, a time away from working out. In our world, those things are called vacations. Most lawyers don't take enough of them. So start thinking about planning a two-week vacation. Maybe it's not next month. Maybe it's not even by the end of the year. Look into 2024 block time on your calendar to take a vacation. Um, and then finally, sleep, it's your superpower. If you're not getting adequate sleep, your body is not recovering and your mind is not recovering. And that takes us to strategy number 10, which Chelsea is gonna to talk to you about. Enjoy the little things. For one day you may look back and realize they were the big things. I love that quote. And I sometimes wish it wasn't so true. We'd like to take this last lesson, a strategy, excuse me, to focus in on a gratitude practice. But before I dive in, I gotta give you this caveat. By gratitude practice, we do not mean toxic positivity, okay? Let's be clear. A gratitude practice is not, oh, everything is wonderful, I should only focus on the negative, on the positive and exclude all of the negative, so on and so forth. Science has showed us that that is not effective and that it's not healthy. In contrast to that, a gratitude practice is an exercise, whether written or not, and you know we're gonna advise on the written, of reflecting on what you're valuing at that time. So oftentimes the easiest way to do this is by keeping a gratitude journal. And again, this isn't the type of gratitude journal that you may have seen on social media where, you know, someone gets up at 5 a.m. and writes paragraphs about everything that's wonderful in their lives. That's not useful and it's not effective. And it's a waste of time, frankly, if I'm going to go out there and say that it's a waste of time for most people, especially busy professionals. What is effective and what is science-based is doing something as simple as setting a timer for five minutes and in bullet points, handwritten, writing out what you were grateful for 
or when you woke up that morning or perhaps from the previous day, or if you're an evening person doing this, what you had that day. It could be things as simple as, I saw a dog that made me smile. I really enjoyed my coffee. I had a good chat with a friend on my commute home. Things like that. It's those tiny little things. We enjoy them in the moment anyway. We're not making them up. But being able to reflect and recognize that enjoyment maximizes them or even multiplies the enjoyment exponentially. So it only takes a few moments to recognize the enjoyment you're already having. So back to the journaling act, it not only gets you seeing the things that you're already enjoying, it makes a habit that helps you see other things more so even in the future. And in doing so, we get to continue to feel that emotion. Finally, right down there in blue, don't force it. This is not some crazy thing we're asking, new age thing we're asking you to do. You already have the skills and the abilities to do this. It's just a matter of taking a few moments to reflect back on what you've already enjoyed. Because even on the toughest day, I bet you there's a little something that you feel appreciative of. And wouldn't it be great if we can build on that in the midst of everything else? Absolutely. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, yeah, and, and when you're writing, feel the emotion. Don't you? I, I had a client once who said, I, have a, I keep a gratitude journal. I check off my three things. And it's, but are you, are you feeling that feeling of gratitude? That's what really gets you connected to, to the exercise. So again, we're going to offer you a tool to help you do this. Um, it's a gratitude challenge tool that allows you to just write down, as Chelsea just said, you know, two or three or four things each day that you're, gra you're grateful for without forcing it. If you're, if you're not feeling it, don't force it. Uh, but try to begin that practice so that you can cultivate that sense of gratitude. So as we finish up, what are you going to start today? You know? When I talk to my clients, I'm all about, what are you going to do? Okay, you've got the knowledge. Knowledge doesn't mean anything unless you do something with it. So our challenge to you is, what will you start doing today? Any of the strategies that we just shared with you are things you can start at 105 or what, at five minutes past the hour, wherever you might be in the country. Today, you can start, and we challenge you to do that. And finally, we want to leave you with some information about our book. Um, the, all of the strategies that we talked about today come out of the book, 50 Lessons for Happy Warriors. We are honored to have an endorsement from the executive director of the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, who happens to be a lawyer, um, for, for her, her thoughts on our book. So we hope that it might help you. There's, there's a link there if you want to go to Amazon and buy it. We'd love to hear what you think about it. And if you have any questions for us, I know that our emails are going to be in the chats if you have questions for us that we can't get to today because we're up against the top of the hour. Also, I want to leave you with this. Atticus has several upcoming workshops, the Practice Growth Program, the W Revenue Workshop, the Management Workshop, and next month, another webinar coming up focused on time management. Uh, if you register for that webinar today, you get 50% off. And so please consider that because if you're managing your time effectively, then you're also definitely, definitely reducing your anxiety. With that, we are going to say thank you to you. We're right up against the top of the hour. Um, are there any questions in the chat that we can answer in a minute or less, Abby? You wouldn't know that, of course. How long <laughs> it take us, but. Um, yes, I did notice a question. Mm -hmm. At one point, asking values and what? It's a disparity between values and behaviors. Values and behaviors. Thank you, Chelsea. Okay. With that, I think, I think we'll... there's two questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Did somebody say something there? I, I was just saying that it was such an insightful session, and I'm really uh, thankful to both of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions for us. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining.